we are going to take up land use as soon as we take the uh, roll. Sorry, Jimenez? Present. Torres? Present. Ortiz? Present. Cohen? Here. Davis? Here. Doan? Present. Candelas? Present. Foley? Here. Batra? Present. Kamei? Here. Mahan? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're on item 10.1 on the under land use. And on 10.1A and B, are we taking those items separately? Uh, we can take them as the consent calendar, yeah, so they can go together. Okay, great. And Chris, do you mind just reminding folks of, since there's a lot of properties here, what it is that we're doing? Just remind people of the general rule that we're uh, adhering to here. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so the state passed law, um, SB or AB, I forget. Was it in the Senate or Assembly? SB 1333, um, which requires charter cities to bring their zoning and general plan into alignment. Um, we did an analysis through the city. We found there's just under 13,000 properties throughout the city that are out of alignment. Um, so over the past year, we've uh, started a process to bring that back into alignment. We're about halfway through, about 6,000 properties have been rezoned to ensure that they meet our existing general plan land use designations. And so this is our next tranche of, of those rezonings. We intend to have this project done by the end of this calendar year. That'll be great. I don't envy you and your team for taking this on, but thank you. Um, okay, why don't we go to public comment? Jill Borders. Hi, thank you. Jill Borders here. I just want to make a comment that there are 834 parcels in the number A section, and there are 255 parcels in the second one that you're discussing. That's a total of 1,089 parcels. That with a single vote right now, and I don't know how much work went into changing these, but that will be changed, that will be rezoned in order to comply with state law. And yet 58, just 58 parcels of mobile home parks, manufactured home parks will be left undone. And so the truth is that it will not be completed by the end of this year. We've been told quite frankly, many, many times, despite even a unanimous vote by the entire mayor and council last year, or the year before, the year before, it's getting confusing now, uh, that, that it would be rezoned. Now we have a state law that will help us along to align them, but here is, here is the fact of the matter. We've been told that it takes a lot of money in planning to get this done. I can understand that. I wish I know where, where, where that came from, where that work comes from that costs so much money for our parts, for 58 parcels versus the 13,000 that are out of alignment that just with a single vote tonight and you not knowing anything else about it other than they're just telling you, hey, we've got to align these and you just vote and it's done. That's how it looks to us. I know planning is working hard, but to us in the public that has worked so hard over years to have some sense of stability in our situation and because we're very at risk, uh, we are struggling to understand why it's so easy to comply with state law on thousands of other parcels, but for these 58 that we wait and we wait and we wait and we have to look and stay vigilant all the time. So it's something to think about and we'd appreciate if you would. Thank you. Back to council. Great, thanks. And Chris, can you just clarify for folks what uh, the, it's not an apples to apples comparison, but I'm not sure the public totally understands the difference. I, I'm certainly supportive of the work we prioritized around mobile home the mobile home park designation, but can you just explain what the difference is here? Yeah, thanks, Mayor. So uh, as I said, the, the work that we're doing uh, with these rezonings is really just bringing it into alignment with the existing general plan. We're changing colors on a map. Well, so in, sure, both cases, more than that. in both cases, we're changing colors on a map. But right now, we have, uh, for all of these parcels, the underlying map, which is the general plan, which is our constitution for development and our forward-looking plan for how we want the city to develop, already says this is what we want on this land. The work we're doing on uh, preservation of our mobile home parks is to change the general plan to create that overlay and provide that additional level of protection uh, for the preservation of those mobile well, home parks. It's a new overlay. Yeah, right. So there's, there's considerably more work that goes into that. Um, there's sequel work that needs to be done, uh, a lot of, you know, additional steps uh, through that process. Okay. I just don't want the public to think that we are not doing that work, but it's not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. One is much more involved and is on our roadmap. 
Great. Okay. Do we have a motion or any questions, comments? Move approval. Great. Thank you. Motion from Cohen, second from Vice Mayor Kamei. I think we're ready to vote. Jimenez? Torres? Yes. Cohen? Jimenez is yes. Sorry. I was trying to find the button. Thank you. Cohen? Hi. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Doan? Aye. Candelas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Batra? Aye. Kame? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're on to item 10.2, Burbank annexation <coughs> item. I believe we have a short presentation. Yes, we do, Mayor. Thank you. Chris Burton, Director of Planning, Building, Code Enforcement. I'm joined by Robert Manford, our Deputy Director for Planning, and David Keon, our Principal Planner for CEQA. Um, the project before you, uh, as noted, is um, the initiation of the annexation for Burbank 44 and the associated pre-zoning. Just one moment. I'm sorry, but there was a, a comment card for item 10.1 um, that I didn't see. Okay. I assume we can hear that public comment now. Sorry, sir. Come on up. Yes, of course. I apologize. That's okay. Sure. Hi there. Good to see you. That's cool. Glad you're up there. Um, my name's Chris Griffin, and I live in the historic district, um, which is on Almaden between Reed and Pierce. And I just had four questions. What I wanted to know is because my house is historic, has the city council taken in consideration the historic features of that area? And then four questions real quick. R1-8 zoning, um, how does it benefit me, TADCO, which is TADCO Janitorial, which is right next door to me? What does the city have planned for that property? Because it's just my house, my two neighbors, and TADCO. So I want to know what the city has planned for that property if they're rezoning a commercial building to residential. And then I also want to know about setbacks because my property has a separated garage and right now there's no, the city planning commission said there's no zero lot line. And I plan on building an ADU in the back where the garage is at. So I need to know if there's setbacks or if it's still zero lot line and then the Last question I had was, uh, oh, if the city plans on purchasing TADCO property and doing something there, is it just going to be residential? Uh, R.1 is only two and a half stories, 35 feet. So that's the questions that I have. So just so you're aware, during public comment, we just take comment. We're not allowed. We're not able. We don't have capacity to answer questions and get into a back and forth. A member of my team, Stephen No, is here, and I'm sure he'd be happy to take down your questions and help route them to the appropriate staff okay. offline. But thank yeah. you for being here. We appreciate it. Yeah, I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah. I want to know that the city, oh, the whole city, you guys, it's a historic district if they're taking that into consideration. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, and Stephen, if you could just uh, speak with this gentleman offline quickly, make sure we follow up. Thank you. Is there any other? Thank you. Any other public comment on ten one? No, there wasn't. Okay, great. So we were. I'm sorry. Just real quick, we. Are, um, he's a constituent of District Three, and we already had a conversation with him too. But. Oh, great. Yeah, okay. We can have conversation. Well, we'll work together to make yeah. sure he gets the answers yes, to his questions. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Council Member. Okay, great. I'm sorry, Chris. We're back on 10 2 Burbank 44 annexation. I believe we have a short staff presentation. We do, yes. So, um, two actions associated with this the annexation of five parcels of what are currently unincorporated county within, uh, sorry, unincorporated area within Santa Clara County. Um, and then with an annexation, we do a pre zoning. Um, so, we'll be pre zoning those same five parcels to MUC, which is the mixed use commercial zoning district. Um, so, uh, in association with this project, and so uh, what will come later is uh, a couple of development projects. So we have a conditional use permit that will allow the demolition of the existing buildings on site, um, and then a tentative map to merge uh, the five lots plus two additional lots uh, to create a larger site for the proposed mixed-use development. Um, and so that, that will come through the Planning Commission subsequent to the annexation. Um, so again, just to sort of give you that sense, uh, this is the site. We have a current general plan land use designation of mixed use commercial. Um, the area is within the West San Carlos Urban Village Plan area. Um, 
I'm going to skip through a couple of these just to give you a sort of a sense of the process that goes through our, uh, our review team as we do these annexations. And we do a lot of coordination with the county and with LAFCO uh, on the annexation boundary. There's work with special districts in the area to ensure uh, that we understand all the implications of annexation. And in this case, uh, the site will remain within the Burbank Sanitation District. Uh, we do community outreach and then analysis against all the city's plans and policies. Um, for environmental rev review, we followed uh, our typical process. Um, this process started uh, late in 2020 um, and has uh, been through an EIR process. Um, we actually uh, got comments uh, through circulation back in July of last year. Um, comments were received from DTSC, from PACSJ, County Roads and Airports, Valley Water, as well as a member of the public. Um, we prepared uh, responses to those comments and they were published with the First Amendment to the EIR back in December. Um, so there were environmental impacts noted associated with the project related to construction air quality, um, potential damage to nesting birds, uh, hazards from residual agricultural chemicals, construction noise and vibration, and uh, project vehicle miles traveled. All of those could be mitigated below the significance threshold. However, uh, there was an impact associated with the demolition of the historic resource, um, which has been determined a candidate city landmark, um, and that will exceed the significance threshold, uh, even with mitigation measures applied. Um, so we did prepare project alternatives. Project alternative two would avoid the impact. Um, however, there are concerns uh, with the ability to actually develop the project within that consideration. Um, so as I said, we prepared responses to the comments uh, and they were published just back in December uh, through the, the first amendment to the draft EIR. Um, so staff's recommendation is to adopt a resolution certifying the environmental impact report uh, for the project and make findings consistent uh, with the uh, significant impacts um, and a statement of overriding considerations. Um, adopt an ordinance pre-zoning the property uh, to mixed-use commercial and then adopt a resolution initiating proceedings uh, for the annexation uh, which has been designated Burbank 44. And with that, staff's available for questions. Great, thank you. Let's go to the public first. Sal Caruso. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, the uh, annexation, uh, we are in full agreement with staff's report. Uh, I'm the project architect for the project that you will be seeing in the future when it comes forward after the annexation certification from LAFCO. And I'm here to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you very much. Mike Sodergren. Uh, good evening, Mike Sodergren, Preservation Action Council. Uh, thank you, Council, for considering this project. Um, the first action we are taking with the annexation of the Burbank 44 uh, property site is to demo all of its buildings, approve a conditional use permit to do that. We understand the desire to develop within the urban village, but we want to point to a couple of things. Um, future development opportunities within the, the urban village, this is the city's own language, um, <clears throat> along the corridor will be, it'll be important to achieve a vibrant urban village that builds on the preferred existing character in keeping with these character defining elements. New developments should avoid demolition and instead seek to adaptively reuse the unique elements that define its character and sense of place. Some of these buildings definitely could be saved as, uh, as the planning director mentioned, and option two uh, with um, an inference that it would cost more uh, to do that. Um, unfortunately, uh, this is a missed opportunity to, um, to pursue the uh, goals of an urban village. And it's apparently a part of a pattern of missed opportunities. Um, I also wanna note um, that it, there are existing businesses that are a part of that of those buildings that um, will no, no longer have a place to work and provide the unique services that uh, are distinctive to San Jose. Thank you. Back to the council. Great, thank you. Council member Ortiz. Thank you, mayor, and thank you staff uh, for your hard work on this presentation and all the zoning processes. Um, I know that you guys are incredibly understaffed, so I really appreciate your work and dedication, especially in uh, urban villages. Um, so I'm a, I'm a supporter of building more housing, a supporter especially for um, senior housing and other um, 
specific use for a specific population housing. Um, my only concern is the whole historical significance of these businesses and storefronts. You know, I myself, people don't know this, but I am an antiquer. I collect uh, political memorabilia, and I've been going to these businesses since I was a youth. Um, and a lot of these storefronts, they're very, um, uh, they're significant to this portion, San Carlos Avenue. Uh, they almost have like a Western style to the storefront. So you don't see this style in any other area. And I'm really concerned about um, retaining uh, the historical architecture uh, uh, of these sites. So I'm, I'm supportive of development. Uh, I'm supportive of, I'm, I'm appreciative that people want to come to our area in, in order to invest and, and build more housing. Um, I'm just really concerned because uh, I'm seeing this start here in this urban village. I know it's already happening in Alam Rock and other urban villages where we have, especially Little Portugal, where we have um, historical small businesses that have been there for, you know, generations um, that now, you know, unfortunately in the pursuit of housing um, may be displaced. So um, I just wanted to see what our planning department can do, whether it's, and I've, I've mentioned this in the past, uh, potentially a right of first refusal for properties. Uh, um, so that so that when businesses are quote unquote displaced for a short period of time, when the property is uh, uh, built, they could have the right of first refusal at the same rate that they were paying uh, for that storefront before the construction. Because um, you know this is antique row, and I just think we need to be intentional with how we're developing these uh, urban villages. And if they do get displaced, I like to see if there's plenty of storefronts here in the city of San Jose. If the city can help these antique shops all relocate to another area so that we can keep the antique row that people come from all over Santa Clara County uh, uh, to visit. So I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear any thoughts that staff have in regards to that. Yeah, thanks for the question, council member. It's certainly something that we're acutely aware of and uh, as we've been digging into the urban village process in different parts of the city, uh, understanding the implications around commercial displacement. Um, currently, we don't have a policy around uh, commercial displacement that allows us to kind of uh, look at different alternatives. It's something that we've been working with the Office of Economic Development to really understand how best uh, to approach that and what programmatic approaches we can take to, to help provide those opportunities for those small businesses that are displaced through this process. Um, but currently, we don't, we don't have anything in place that can help support that. Other I, than sort of I appreciate that. When do you think we will have a, a commercial displacement policy? Because time, you know, it's, it's against us and we're working on the five wounds plan as of right now. What I don't want is to, you know, see our Portuguese coffee shops replaced with Starbucks uh, uh, and things like that. We need to retain the cultural significances of our small business corridors. So uh, do we have a timeline on that? <coughs> So we don't currently have a timeline on a, a sort of policy document that would really address this. I think um, specific to the, the five wounds piece in Little Portugal, obviously the urban village plan will help flash that out to some extent. Um, and then it really, at the moment, it really comes down to sort of the individual projects as we move through this process. Um, but it's something we'll, we'll take back and follow up on um, and coordinate with, uh, as I said, the Office of Economic Development. I appreciate this. I know we've had this conversation in many briefings. I'm sure once you saw my name up, you knew what I was gonna say. <clears throat> but this just goes to the point that, you know, we can't be planning the future of our city by parcel by parcel. I know we have a downtown plan. I know we have a North San Jose plan, but each side of our city has its own culture. It has its own personality. Um, and we need to make sure that it's not just a whole bunch of puzzle pieces that don't fit together. So I really hope that you're, you're taking my words for what it, what it is and we could follow up with something because if not, then um, our, our city is just going to, the culture of our city is just going to be washed away. Thank you. Thanks, Council Member. Let's go to Council Member Batra. In your this recommendations, you, you're showing on the uh, page with the recommendation on the B item that you are retaining the, uh, in the conditional uh, use permit, you are retaining the facade and some of the other things about the architecture? Or is that not the case? Am I misreading it? Commissioner, Council Member, this is Robert Mann for Deputy Director for Planning. I believe for this particular project, all the existing uh, buildings will be demolished. Okay, <clears throat> all right. That's not how this comes across. 
Okay, uh, so you may want to look at the wording which is indicating is, is uh, except for the stained and retention of the facade, street facing facade and a portion of the existing roof and the construction of a 220 20 story building. So, uh, so your clarification is that nothing is being retained. Good evening, council members. That is the 19th or second project. That is actually deferred to March 28th. So oh. that's, that project is <laughs> okay. not before so the, the I'm reading ahead, you're meeting. saying. Yeah, thank you. Okay, all right. Okay, so this one, there's nothing applicable to that one, okay. Um, I, yeah, and then I don't have any other questions on it, and I move the resolution to uh, for adoption. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second from Councilmember Davis, and we have Councilmember Cohen up next. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I, you went over it very fast, so I'm trying to um, <laughs> understand your project alternative slide. <clears throat> you list a number of project alternatives, and I think you said something about how they're, we, we can't, in, we're not, um, they're not feasible but I didn't understand it because it was very quick. So can you just talk about this? Because there were some alternatives here that preserve some of the historic buildings and, and some that preserve facades. There were various pr uh, preservation alternatives. So Council Member Cohen, when we go through the CEQA process, we are required to consider alternatives that meet the basic objectives of a project whilst minimizing significant environmental impacts. So we looked at all the alternatives and alternative two, alternative two would definitely do that. But it wouldn't be feasible because the applicant provided information to show that uh, uh, if they went that way, the, the project would not be built, able to be built. So, 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 okay, so it's not feasible because the project doesn't, wouldn't be um, worth the developer to, to Maybe it's a question for the, de for that, that's correct. the developer to, to answer. I mean, so these alternatives are here, and can you just talk a little bit about them and what the project, what kind of consideration we might be able to make towards those? Thank you, council members and mayor. The alternatives presented, as was illustrated, is that by keeping one or both of the buildings in the center of the project, it basically cuts through what is a multi-story building and it's not a matter of it's not just financially not feasible, it simply will, um, it's like saying keeping a one-story house in the middle of the city hall block right here. How do you build the city hall tower around a one-story house in the middle of this block? That's what makes it infeasible, is that it's incompatible perhaps is a better terminology. So it's not a, just a financial feasibility, it's literally not possible to build the project. And this is, I know we're not discussing the project supposedly tonight, but the project is a senior project for uh, senior care and uh, 61 residential units. So uh, under the alternatives that are required by CEQA, we looked at all the various alternatives that were explored and evaluated by the city of San Jose, and it was deemed that those other alternatives are not practical, not just by our input, but by the findings of CEQA, by state law. Okay, thank you. I think that answers that question. I, I'll, I'll just ask questions into the staff. Um, you, you talked about a policy for displaced businesses. Um, and I, I do appreciate Councilmember Ortiz's suggestion about um, the ability to come back afterwards. But m more, more what I'm thinking is that, you know, we have an economic development, and this would be a question maybe for Nancy if she were here, but she's not. Um, when we, when we get these developments and we have small businesses in those buildings, it seems to me that we should automatically at least be trying to facilitate alternative locations throughout the city, especially at a time when we have so many vacant storefronts across our city. So do we have any coordination when these things happen? Do we have any, um, is there some automatic discussion that occurs with these business owners? So uh, thanks, Councilmember. I'm happy to answer for Nancy at any any given moment, and I do have some previous experience in this matter, so I can. Careful, uh, she might call in and rebut. Oh, I'm, I'm sure she will, Mayor. I'm sure she will. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what I can tell you is that the business development team in the Office of Economic Development uh, does coordinate with us on a, a regular basis. And um, actually, pre-pandemic, there'd been a considerable amount of work gone on along the Alum Rock Corridor as a series of projects had come in through the Urban Village Plan um, that were 
we're creating a potential for significant displacement of small businesses in that area. Um, and so we, uh, we're coordinating very closely with that team uh, so that they understand what applications are coming in and the sort of the implications of development. Part of the challenge is often the timing relative to development. So when we do an entitlement project, there's by no means a guarantee that that will start at that point. Um, quite often they will sit um, you know, potentially up for a, a number of years before uh, any action is taken. And, and sort of one of the challenges is, you know, we're obviously not party to some of the discussions between landlord and tenant. Um, they'll often transition tenants to sort of months to months so they have more flexibility. Um, so what we've done is to try and uh, build those linkages and, and sort of start that coordination earlier so the Office of Economic Development has the opportunity to get out there and start those conversations, can look at sort of how to help those businesses transition. Um, as it relates to sort of businesses sort of leaving and then coming back, you know, one of the biggest barriers to any small business as it relates to displacement is just the cost of relocation. And so the idea of doing it twice is often, you know, incredibly prohibitive. Um, so it's often a case where we're transitioning them to another location that will be permanent rather than sort of out and back. Um, but it's definitely something we, we do and we work closely with. Obviously, the pandemic disrupted that to some extent. Um, and, and we'll sort of take it on as an item to follow up and ensure that we're, we're doing that work now as well. Yeah, that final point was kind of the root why, I mean, I think Councilman Bortiz made a good suggestion, except that I think you're right. I mean, I, it occurred to me right away that, you know, we're not going to take a business and either have them be shut down for two years or three years while a building's being built or move them back and forth. But some kind of assistance or discussion should be there. And if there's policy that's lacking in the city to help facilitate that, let's have that conversation maybe offline and figure out what we can do to propose policy that will improve that interaction, that process. Okay, thanks. It's not exactly the same situation, but I know we're, we're actively doing that right now with, in discussion with small businesses here on Santa Clara that could be displaced by the BART extension. Uh, that, that's correct, Mayor. And, uh, and also we, there was work done around um, downtown West as well, um, specifically around how do we help businesses in that situation. Yeah, um, okay. I know we have a couple of colleagues online with hands up. I believe Councilmember Davis was next, followed by Jimenez. Go ahead, Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to ask if um, Sal could come down. I have one question for him about the- He's making the his way. Okay. So um, Sal, the existing uses, the, the easiest thing would be if they could stay on site. I don't know if that's feasible um, or incompatible, as you talked about the buildings themselves being incompatible, but right. would, would your client be open to keeping those, those uses on the site? Certainly, once the new building is built, they are certainly welcome to be part of it. And maybe since there are vacancies in the immediate surroundings, they could occupy something nearby. The good thing about antique store, and I also do antiquing, by the way, Councilmember Ortiz. Um, <laughs> The good thing about antiquing is that um, it's easy to relocate in the sense that, yes, there's a lot of merchandise to relocate, but it doesn't require plumbing and a huge amount of infrastructure like a restaurant per se or a coffee shop, which right. hopefully will be preserved in the Portuguese district, which I'm a fan of. Um, so the, the the concept is that you know this is something that could be easily go into a lot of vacant areas that are in the immediate vicinity so they don't lose the uh, the heritage of the neighborhood. And, and then that way just come back when, uh, when the space is finished because we do have a large amount of retail space on the ground floor that will be available and I'd love to have them back. The owners would, I'm the architect, not the owner, just to be clear. <laughs> That's great, thank you. And well, you said it's a senior living facility and how many units did you say? Uh, 61 residential and approximately, I apologize, wasn't prepared for the project, but roughly 200 plus senior citizens uh, uh, beds for the facility. Okay. Okay. Oh, so it's it's um, not just a senior living facility, but also kind of a skilled nursing. Skilled nursing. Yes. Okay. Okay. And the fact that there are a lot of shops. A, I'm sorry. Got it. I know that's a sorely needed use in our in our city and in our area. So I I just wanted that clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's good to hear that the there's an there's the possibility that the antique stores could be still on site. I, I really, um, I do think that, that you know, Councilmember Ortiz, you made really good points about not wanting to lose the character of the neighborhood. And this seems like a very good, um, a very good 
solution that would help the the neighborhood evolve as opposed to just com change completely. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for me, Mayor. Great. Thanks, Council Member. Appreciate the questions. I'm not seeing any other hands. Just want to make sure. Am I missing anyone? Council Member Dewan. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, staff. Uh, just got a few questions. Uh, for the final news, the proposed density seem a little bit low, or too low for that matter. The D Department of Economic Development and Housing have both told my uh, staff and I that they want 95 unit density per acre uh, or more. This seemed like to be half of that. Is that because the proposed news is mixed news? Or what is the rationale behind that? Sorry, council member, one moment, just pulling up that information. So- um, No worries. Often what we look for when we look for uh, density, I think, uh, in the conversation with the Office of Economic Development uh, and others, um, is that sweet spot tends to be around 55 units to the acre. Um, but obviously with uh, our urban villages, um, we look at a range of densities uh, in a number of different locations, um, just given the different types of housing available. I'm going to have David answer this question, I think. Good evening, City Council members. Um, part of that is because a good portion of the project, most of the project is actually assisted in living. That's 246 beds. And so that is taking up a lot of what could have been residential. So that's why the residential density is less than what it could have been because most of the project is assisted in living. So there are, in fact, a lot of people there and for lack of a better term, economic use much beyond just what would be implied by the number of units, essentially. Number of people served and, and tax base, to the council member's point, is larger than is implied by the number of units. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say, Mayor. And, and again, sort of when we look at urban villages, we look at a range of different uh, land use types. And so uh, the maximum density in a mixed-use commercial is actually 50 units to the acre. Um, so the, the maximum amount of, of residential units you could put on this site is the 61, so it's maximum out. It's actually, and then you've got the, the residential care piece that's in addition to that. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, not seeing any other hands. Any other hands from colleagues online? I'm not actually in the Zoom. Okay. Great. Let's vote. Sorry, Jimenez? Yes. Aye. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Doan? Aye. Candelas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Batra? Yes. Jime? Aye. Mayhan? Hi. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That passes. We are on to our final item of the night, item 10-3, site development permit at 550 East Brokaw Road. Do we have a presentation? We do, Mayor. Just a, a brief presentation to talk about this project. Um, I'll just dive right in while it's coming up. Um, so this is a, a site development permit on the former Fry's site at Brokaw and 880 uh, up in North San Jose, um, just at the northern portion of District 3. Um, it's a site development permit that includes the demolition of the existing Fry's building. It's about 200,000 square feet. Um, and we'll be removing uh, roughly 274 trees on the site, um, resulting in the construction of seven new office buildings, totaling 1.9 million square feet, um, and two associated parking structures as well. In addition to the site development permit, there's a vesting tentative map to, to subdivide the lot uh, as part of that construction project. Um, the underlying uh, land use designation for the general plan is combined industrial commercial uh, and it has a, an associated zoning district which are consistent uh, with the proposed development. Again, sort of our process for uh, project review um, ensures consistency with the general plan with the municipal code. In North San Jose, we have a particular set of design guidelines that we ensure consistency with uh, and then obviously CEQA and our public outreach policy. Um, for environmental review, we completed a supplemental EIR. Um, the draft supplemental EIR was circulated 
um, between May and June, and we had less than significant impacts with mitigation for biological resources, cultural resources, hazardous materials, noise, and tribal cultural resources. Um, there is a significant and unavoidable impact related to vehicle miles traveled, uh, so transportation, and therefore the city will need to, uh, sorry, city council will need to approve, uh, adopt a statement of overriding, overriding considerations uh, associated with this project. Um, the first amendment to the supplemental EIR was uh, posted on the city website back in November. Um, the project came through Planning Commission just back in January, I believe it was January 12th. Uh, Planning Commission voted uh, to recommend that the City Council adopt the resolution certifying the uh, environmental impact report for the project, adopt a resolution uh, approving subject to conditions the vesting tentative map, and adopt a resolution approving subject to conditions the site development permit to allow the project as proposed. And with that, we're available for questions. Great. Thanks, Chris. Let's go to public comment. Alex? Hey, Tony. I think I'll save it for open forum because it was related to annexation and business retention issues. Okay. Mike? Sorry, Tony. Um, we go to the applicant typically. Oh, first. sorry. Yeah. I, I also want to note we, had, we already had open forum. Um, so the applicant oh. of Brian or, or Ryan, I, neither one of them's online. Yeah, in person. Oh, they came in in person, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, good evening, Mayor and, and Council Members. Uh, uh, appreciate you having us here tonight. We're excited to bring this project. My name is Brian Wolf, partner at Bay West Development. Um, you know, we've been working on this a, a while. There's been a lot of growth and development in North San Jose in the last decade or so. We're, um, you know, we were a part of that uh, from a housing perspective. We're excited to continue those efforts uh, to bring additional jobs uh, to North San Jose. Um, I am happy to answer any questions. We agree with everything um, uh, presented in the staff report, um, and we thank them for all their hard work throughout this process. Uh, I do have our team, our architectural team at Gensler here to do a, just a little visual presentation for you guys and kind of describe from a design perspective where we were going with this. Uh, and then again, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Brian. Good evening, city council members, mayor. Um, is there a Way to, I, I believe we sent in a presentation, but is there a way to plug in? Thank you. There's a little, oh, there. Okay. Yeah, okay, if you can look at the little thing that pops up here on first. So go ahead and minimize this. Okay. Sorry, right. it's okay. <laughs> there we go. If that doesn't work, did I heard the presentation was sent in? Do we have it queued up on our system? Or no, you don't have it. Okay. And we'll have to figure this out. Thank you for your patience, everybody. Beautiful. Look at that. Excellent. Good evening, council members, mayor. Uh, my name is Ross Guntert. I'm a design director at Gensler. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to share 550 East Brokaw with you alongside our development partners. Um, you know, this development, as stated previously, uh, is, proposed, is proposing a new campus of roughly uh, 2 million square feet 
of a Class A office building with expansive outdoor space, um, you know, with the aims to enrich and cultivate the neighborhood of uh, North San Jose. Some of the key design drivers for this project um, are really to contribute to the public realm and the urban context uh, while embracing the environmental conditions of the site uh, to design a sustainable and attractive campus that would attract world-class tenants uh, to the San Jose market. The site is situated in North San Jose. Uh, the proposed de development is in close proximity to the VTA light rail and in fair proximity to Caltrain, Amtrak, BART, San Jose, uh, so the San Jose Airport and within blocks of the Coyote Creek Trail. Um, I-880 runs uh, directly parallel um, uh, to our site, uh, providing great vehicular access and a, a short car ride to Deardon Station. This site plan uh, depicts how the seven, seven to eight story uh, structures are organized around a central green belt. Uh, the two parking structures uh, that are located just planned south, uh, south of this drawing um, have direct vehicular access uh, into the development from East Brokaw Road and Junction Road. Uh, you know, coming out of the pandemic, uh, one of the big things that our our firm has seen um, is uh, the number one amenity that tenants are looking for is outdoor space. Um, and so the concept of the green belt was developed to provide uh, the users with a series of outdoor amenity spaces which contribute to the health and wellness uh, driven experience for this development. Um, here are a series of uh, renderings uh, that are looking at the, that kind of green belt experience. Uh, this, is, this first view uh, depicts the upper levels of that green belt, uh, the interconnected outdoor terraces and various levels between buildings to create this really unique outdoor experience um, and uh, leveraging this wonderful climate that we live in. Uh, critical to the design uh, was the environmental response of these buildings to the local climate and for the site conditions to be designed sustainably and responsibly. Building massing and orientation inform the facade approach uh, with the main objectives of reducing solar heat gain in the buildings and glare to optimize energy performance and user comfort. Uh, here's another visualization uh, looking at the ground floor between buildings uh, where folks enter into uh, lobbies on either side of this covered entryway um, and a central drop-off area at the heart of the green belt. Uh, you can start to see how that landscape begins to stitch, uh, stitch these buildings together. And finally, uh, a, a bird's eye view uh, of this development um, in, in its context. Um, I'll follow off where, where, I, where we started, which is really the, the project goals. And for us, it's really to create an attractive and sustainably responsible development, providing quality outdoor spaces that contribute um, to the tenants in the local community. Uh, we look forward to your questions, and we're here to answer them. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. I was just informed that the presentation was not viewable online to folks. So we, um, is it posted by any chance? No, but if somebody sends me a copy, I can post it. Great. Um, yeah, the, the way we had to do it, it had to go up on this screen, and that screen is not accessible. Okay, apologies to everyone viewing online. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. the presentation. We took public comment, so we're now on to council discussion. No, we, um, there was another hand up when we went to the, the applicants. So we have Mike. Oh, okay. Let's yeah. finish public comment then. Mike Sadegren, Preservation Action Council. Um, PAC is definitely not opposed to this project. Uh, we think it um, has a marvelous potential for um, new commercial development and uh, the things that will go on inside those, those buildings. Um, but we do wonder <clears throat> what can be done to preserve and memorialize this truly iconic business. For those of us who grew up here, we've seen it, the transition from orchards to semiconductors. And this store with their unique uh, facades, these stores, the Fry's chain of stores um, across the South Bay locations tell a story not only of technology, but the people who live here. And this is a store where you could buy everything from Doritos to diodes and transistors and microcontrollers. And I just point out that the Fry's family was really a big family supporting the arts. And so um, with 
with the passing of the business, um, which was a natural passing, um, you know, just the, the call to the developer is, how do you memorialize this? And how do you feature this? And how do you put something together that will inspire the people that are gonna occupy this building to do the kind of things that the people that went in and shopped there did in their spare time in their garages? Thank you. Back to council. Great, thank you. Council member Jimenez. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I have a, a question or two for the applicant, if they can uh, go back up. Um, Applicants, walk them back up. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I see the back of his head as he's making it. <laughs> yeah, th thank you so much for the information, sir. I appreciate it. Yep. What I'm curious about is, you know, we often approve many of these uh, items as they come before us every Tuesday, uh, but oftentimes, unfortunately, things aren't built. <laughs> And what I'm curious about is how, how uh, much of a certainty do you have that you're actually going to build this, uh, build out this development? Uh, and, and if you can also speak to whether you're, is it, is it built on spec? Uh, do you have a tenant? If you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, as you know, we're in interesting economic times today, and it's a constantly, you know, moving target. We do not have a tenant currently in hand for this project. Um, you know, we started this process almost three years ago now, so even getting through a process that requires an EIR on something that is zoned as of right takes a long time in the state of California. It, it is the facts of what it is and, and what we deal with on a daily basis. Um, this is the entitlement stage of the project. We still have a number of months of uh, construction documentation work that we would have to do. Um, before we're even ready to break ground. Um, and so we'll continue to, to evaluate the market as, as time progresses. Okay, all right. Um, you know, one, one of the reasons I ask that is I make my way, even though I don't represent North San Jose, I actually represent the other side of the city, but the other end of the city, but I make my way down at North San Jose quite frequently and I can't help but uh, see a lot of, sometimes it's class B sort of office space and such, but sometimes it, it, it's relatively, uh, there's a lot of vacancies. Uh, and so that's what sort of prompted me to ask you this question because it, it, it seems like there's already a, a lot of vacancies going on in that particular part of the city and curious how you think that this particular inventory, assuming it gets built, uh, is going to is gonna really be able to thrive when others haven't been able to. Yeah, so this product is very different than what I would call class B or C class office properties. We've seen uh, certainly post pandemic a shift uh, in office demand move more toward these newer class A projects. This is also a pretty unique site in its scale. There's not many properties in all of Silicon Valley that can provide this, this amount of scale to provide a, a more campus type feel than individual buildings. And so, you know, we think that there's a, a unique uh, characteristics to this build, uh, to this project that uh, would create a certain level of demand that may not be there for, you know, your your tilt building or class B C and C office product. Right, okay, thank you. And then the other question I had is, I, I, I apologize if I've missed it. I was trying to pay attention, reviewed, I, re reviewed the item, but, do you expect to have uh, some commercial space uh, at the bottom, like retail or other type of amenities that's gonna serve these, these, these folks? And the reason I ask that is that on that particular side of the freeway, in that immediate area, there isn't a whole lot of sort of uh, attractions, if you will, such as restaurants and other amenities. I know there's stuff on the other side of the freeway on the corner of Brokaw, uh, but just curious uh, what your thoughts are on that and if that's the expectation. Uh, yeah, there'll certainly be amenities on site uh, that will be somewhat tenant demand driven, um, but at a, on a property of this scale, uh, you're typically building those type of things into the office property, whether that's on the ground floor or other floors. Think of things like uh, major cafeterias, gyms, those type of amenities that serve uh, the office users on site. Again, those are driven by tenants' needs, and so you're not programming that at, at this stage of the game. Right, right. Okay. Um, well, well, listen, I'm supportive of the project. I hope you actually, you know, after moving forward, actually get it built. I think it'd be a wonderful addition to that particular space. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, I had to uh, read it twice, but the, the, the fact that we're, we're going to have to eliminate, I think, about 200 trees, um, it, it's just a lot, you know, a huge amount of trees. And so, um, you know, I, I assume that you all are going to be paying whatever fee is, is necessary to get some of that planted and, and 
hopefully we can abide by some of the policies that have been established by this council to make sure they're planted in parts of the city that really are tree deficient. And actually, you know, looking at the screen, I see Council Member Cohen, he's probably nodding his head, but my recollection is I think District 4 <laughs> is in desperate need of trees, so hopefully you can sprinkle these throughout his district. But uh, thank you for answering my questions. I appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member. And I'll move approval if I haven't already. Second. Is that it, Council Member? Don't, don't leave. Don't leave. <laughs> okay, we're on to Council Member Cohen. Okay, I'm gonna. Have to, I'll, I'll go first, and then I'll let you make the motion if you want. Oh no, it's already motion made. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, I have a f one for a question first for you while you're there. Yeah. Um, actually, a couple. There was I I had seen something about some plans to memorialize the Fry's motif in some way. Is that still? Is there something in the project to to uh, do that? Again, we would typically do that when we're starting to do the interior design of the buildings. We're not doing it on the exterior, at least our current currently aren't plans to do that from an exterior perspective. And so anything done there would be on an interior design perspective once we start getting into that stage of the development. Yeah, I appreciate that. I spent a lot of time in that Fries and Love and Mayan <laughs> motif. I, I, I will say I know this is officially in District 3, but I consider, I want to I want to claim joint custody over this site <laughs> because it's right on the border and it really is, it really is kind of D4, D3 <laughs> uh, area. Um, the other question I have, and this is the question, I, I, I can look over at Chris and, and he'll know exactly what I'm going to ask next. You have a lot, I know you're early in your design phase, so this is a perfect time for me to bring this up. My preference on projects like this is that we're doing something good with the roof. Um, I think that building in solar and a lot of this, a lot of roof space to do so would be really, really good if we're talking about building green buildings. I saw also some covered walkways. There's a lot of opportunity for, for solar, although that might be shadowed, but I think we should consider that. If not, I know you have some green exterior space and might not want more green roof space, so I think this is a perfect type of project, perfect location, high buildings that will be, um, Anyway, just yeah, we'll bring absolutely that up as a take suggestion. that into consideration. Thank you. Yeah, I know yeah. you're not you're not yet. At the <laughs> We're not the phase, quite there so, yet, but yes. So that, I just want to bring that up early, since I often when we see these projects coming later, it's too late. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to mention that now. Um, I do appreciate that this does say while a lot of trees are coming out, you're going to put in 500 replacements on site, and then there'll be some additional. So that's good. Although I I recommend kind of following up to Sir to Council Member Jimenez's comments. When we take out large trees and replace them with ones that'll take 20 years to get large again, that's not as desirable as finding ways to use the site and trees that might already be there and keeping them. Sometimes along the facade, along the front, you can use the sidewalk and keep the trees there. So I also want to encourage that kind of thoughtful approach as you move forward. Yep, will do, thank you. Okay, my rest of my questions are for, um, uh, for planning, not for you. Well, because you may, maybe wait, because I think maybe <laughs> Council Member Torres has a question for you. Just one quick question. I know that this is similar to the campus that was built down the road at the corner of First and Brokaw, which has those ni you know nice new modern buildings. How occupied are those? I mean, I know San Jose, North San Jose is doing pretty well with occupancy, but how are we right now in terms of those new buildings? Uh, that's a good question, Council Member. I actually don't have that number to hand, but it's something that we can follow up on. Um, I know they were, uh, I believe, the majority of that campus was pre-leased. I don't know what the occupancy level is at this point. And I know that this is a long-term project and we're hoping things will be different in the long term. So um, just kind of a question. And the last thing I'll say, and I know my, my friends from DOT aren't here, but for three years I've been talking to them, or two and a half years I've been talking to them about Brokaw 880, the bottleneck that is Brokaw Road under 880. This clearly will potentially exacerbate that problem. It narrows, there's a lane lost because of the, the way it's configured under 880 and the way the exit ramps are done there this, you know, an opportunity to try it in conjunction, um, and, and there's nobody here in this room to, to, to hear this appropriately, but in conjunction with this work to think about how we might figure out what to do with that interchange and widen that to get rid of that bottleneck and also provide bike-friendly access under 880. So I'll just bring that up now. Great. Thanks, Council Member. I knew you were going to get in the trees. Well done. Um, Council Member Torres. Trees are important. <laughs> Cut the concrete is the, the saying. Uh, so I, I want to say thank you to, to our planning commission and our city staff uh, and Byron for, for already uh, a answering a lot of the questions that I've been having since, since, uh, since you know, I learned about the project. Uh, so just uh, real quick, um, have you done any projects in San Jose that you can point to? 
Yeah, we're under, I think we probably have one of the most recent uh, projects to break ground in the city uh, at Bascom Station. We're building 590 apartment units. There's an off 200,000 square foot office component Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, um, that's the most recent one we've broken ground on. We built the air apartment complex, uh, up in North San Jose, I believe in 2015 is when we completed that one. Um, so yeah, we have a, we have a long history. We're based out of the city of Campbell. Um, so we're local here. Gr great. And then I know that, um, that in the planning commission meeting, uh, there was, uh, there was, um, folks from the Carpenters Union that were there, and are you gonna be having conversations with our unions to help construct these these office buildings? Yeah, so we're, again, early stages of this, where this is the entitlement stage. We still have, you know, call it 12 to 15 plus months of uh, construction documentation work to do. We typically uh, start interviewing and talking to general contractors um, closer to the time that we're breaking ground, so we don't, for example, know who our general contractor today would be, um, but those conversations will start happening, you know, in the coming months as we start progressing with our plans. Great, thank you. And then, um, just real quick, I think it's uh, I think it's very important that we work with our Office of Economic Development that when these buildings are built, that we have a really good uh, tenant or tenants there, uh, because uh, you know, although this is in District Three, a lot of these office workers are going to be working. Uh, throughout the city or throughout the region, so uh, definitely looking forward to this, uh, to these these buildings being built. Awesome, with Thank a lot you. of trees. Yes, and a lot Thank of open you. space. So, yep. Thank you. I think your green belt is popular. Yeah. Um, let's go to Councilor Robacho. If everything goes right, what would be the earliest time when there would be occupancy in these buildings? If everything yeah, most goes perfectly, scenario. yeah. If everything goes perfectly, we have kind of 12 to 15 months of, of construction documentation work to do, starting right now. Um, they, we would we would break ground at that point. It'd be about a two-year build um, for a first phase of a project. Again, that's not the entire property. That would be a, a first phase of that project. Um, so, in an ideal, perfect world, it's kind of three plus years to occupancy of a first phase of buildings. Okay. And then again, if a tenant comes along and wants the whole thing and wants it built immediately, then obviously that can be yes. expedited. Hey, and, and the, like in some of the cities, they are making solar mandatory in residentials and in commercial buildings. We don't have any such requirement on you, do we? Uh, the requirement is uh, a lead requirement. So we're required, I believe, to be lead silver. Um, Staff could probably correct me if I'm wrong. So there is a minimum environmental um, standard that we will need to meet. There's obviously a checklist of items that can get you to that with solar being one of them along with many others. So there is a standard, um, I will say, just based on, on doing stuff in other municipalities, it's a higher standard than, than a lot of places. And so um, that's the standard that we would be using. Thank you. Thanks, council member. Okay. Not seeing any other hands. I believe we have a motion. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Doan? Aye. Candelas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Batra? Aye. Kamei? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Congratulations to the applicant, thank you. Okay, we're on for the second time today to open forum. And if you commented in open forum earlier, you were not eligible to comment this evening. Is that right, Tony? That's correct. Okay, and this is for any members of the public who wish to comment on items not on today's agenda. Alex? Hey, good evening, council members. Thanks for your patience the next two minutes. This is Alex Shore. Executive Director of Catalyze SV. It was great to hear council members talking about local businesses and small businesses and retention. Thanks, Council Member Ortiz and Council Member Cohen. It's definitely, uh, we've had some experience on this at Catalyze SV, our members with projects, and it's, it's certainly not enough, but there's a project on West San Carlos 
that's hopefully coming forward to a 100% affordable housing project, or maybe it won't come forward to you because of uh, state laws streamlining affordable housing. But one of the points of input from our members was to incorporate something because it's right on West San Carlos in this corridor of Antique Row. And so our members asked the developer to incorporate perhaps some antiques on the site, say on the ground floor, um, so to celebrate this area. And the developer has said that they're going to call uh, their project oh, Villas on the Row uh, in celebration of antique row so there are things that you all can ask for i think as you're talking to developers in your district or citywide the other point is there's a great example of a community asset that was not getting displaced from a building on april 7th catalyze sv and we've been talking with council member torres about this is going to be doing a tour of a development in the japantown neighborhood that just got built in the last year or two, and it did not displace the Empire 7 Studios art gallery because the developer chose to bring the Empire 7 Studios back into the development by giving them 800 square feet in the gallery. So if you'd like to see that project and learn more, come out on Friday, April 7th, and check that out. It's a great example of how small businesses or a community asset, in this case, an art studio, continue to be in our community even when development occurred. Thanks so much for your time. Mike? Mike Sodergren, PAC uh, San Jose. Uh, just to follow up on the comment from Catalyze SV, um, cities like Los Angeles have an adaptive reuse ordinance that San Jose does not have. Um, and it provides financial incentives to developers to retain and integrate existing buildings and businesses into their projects. It would be uh, great if the city uh, leadership would uh, direct planning um, to uh, pursue the development of this sort of ordinance. Thank you. Back to council. Thank you. We're adjourned. Have a great evening, everyone.